Hello, welcome everyone. Good to see you joining in. Welcome, welcome. Glad you could be here with us today. Um, my name is Rebecca Goldberg and I am a co-facilitator for the Out of School Time Impact Group for Grantmakers for Education. This is uh, one of our monthly stakeholder calls um, that is designed to be for field leaders and for funders in the youth development space. So we're so glad that you're here with us today. Today's conversation is about how after school programs can support and develop positive racial, cultural, and gender identities. I think we all know that youth programs play a critical role in supporting positive identity development. Can't help but mention this past week's events, um, the awful racially motivated shooting in Buffalo targeting the, uh, the black community. The fact also we've had many things in the news recently about the nation just starting to barely acknowledge the historical efforts to erase native culture and language and ongoing legislative attacks against the LGBTQ plus community. Those are just a few examples of the context that young people and really all of us are navigating day to day. This context makes it all the more important to have supportive spaces and places that young people can go to reaffirm and celebrate their identities. And in youth development, we often talk about taking an asset-based approach and using asset-based uh, language versus deficit-based. So today we'll hear a little bit more about some research on, on just that today and, and how it can help us better understand um, what it means and actually looks like in practice. We're also gonna hear from several practitioners about what positive identity development looks like in their work with young people. And I wanted to um, share, yesterday I was able to join the National Urban League's webinar on their new social emotional learning tools for equity. It was an excellent webinar. Uh, I know the recording is gonna be up in a couple of weeks. So I'm gonna share some links to the, the tools and resources in the chat. Um, and I encourage you to go back and look for that recording. But um, one of the tools is a rubric that programs can use to assess how their programs are um, using as social emotional learning tools for equity. One of their design principles is specifically around positive identity development. And I thought some of the language was helpful for this conversation. So I just wanna share uh, some of the language from their tools. Uh, so this, they asked, do young people have sufficient opportunities to develop and explore their personal, collective, personal and collective identities as part of the intentional promotion of thriving across multiple domains? And when it's working in programs, they say it supports healthy human development of multiple aspects of identity understood in all their contradictions and complexities, particularly in relation to equity and justice. So I thought that was helpful language. Um, this is complex work. We don't have just one identity. We all have multiple identities that intersect with one another. And, uh, you know, and I'm happy to be highlighting important research as well as leaders in our field who are um, supporting this work and, and will highlight great examples of what this could look like day to day with young people. So um, before I go on, um, we have with us today, Bronwyn Bevan, who's the Director of Research with the Wallace Foundation. And Bronwyn's gonna share just a little bit of an introduction to this uh, research that we'll hear more about and why the foundation invested in it. So thanks, Bronwyn. Sure. Um, well, thanks, Rebecca, and um, it's great to be here. Um, I joined the Wallace Foundation just about three years ago, which was just before we went into this lockdown. So I have not had the opportunity to meet so many people in the field. I was working as a researcher at the University of Washington before that. At any rate, I just want to do a little bit of introduction. Um, I'm really so happy to be able to introduce to you Deepa Vasudevan, um, just a couple of minutes. Um, Deepa was part of a research team that um, did a study for the Wallace Foundation to inform the work that we're doing in our child and youth development um, work going forward. And I know she's gonna present some of that and also some other research that is um, that she's done on her uh, part of her whole research agenda. But I just wanted to share just a couple of things to, to frame how valuable we found this for our own kind of internal conversations and deliberations. Um, what, and I should say, first of all, what they did was they interviewed a number of um, experts out in the field. They also conducted a lit review and they also did a, a YPAR, Youth uh, Participatory Action Study. And so it was sort of this multi um, uh, parts, uh, multi component uh, research study done over about a year and a half that wound, that was 
uh, came to a conclusion about six months ago or so. And we now have some research briefs that kind of summarize what they found that are on our website. Um, for us, I think there were some really big takeaways, and one relates to this notion of um, asset-based and deficit-based. I mean, we all hear about that and talk about that all of the time, but I think what we really heard from um, staff and leaders of programs and youth um, was how um, how much the the day-to-day -day continues to be organized around like problems that we are going to fix. And I think that that's, that sort of almost comes with the territory of why does one lead, lead a, why does one start an organization? Why does one lead a, an effort? Why does one fund something? In part, we are, we are motivated, motivated by this desire to make the world better. And that implies that something is not as good as it could be. And so there's this sort of natural deficit framing that we can slip into rather than like, what is great that can be amplified through this work and i think that really came through in the the work that they did and and part of that was um learning from the youth themselves how much especially older youth but i think this is probably equally true for younger kids having had younger kids at one point who are now older adults um that uh people young just like us young people are looking for their people they're looking for their scene and i think this has a lot to do with the issues of identity we'll be hearing about they want to be with other people that inspire them and they want to go to be in places where those people that they want to hang out with um, and and be with and learn with are and so i think that's it was just another very instructive thing for us to remember like you can put lots of things in place but if young people especially when they have choices aren't seeing and being with who they want to be with, um, you know, you've, you're kind of missing uh, an opportunity to allow them to become who they are becoming. And the last point I want to make is that um, what came through also so centrally, and I know Deep is going to talk about it, is how, how all, our whole vision of what powerful out of school time learning um, really in the end rests on the shoulders of the frontline staff. It is on them in the end to create the climate, to create the relationships, just to create the moments for young people to want to be there and to thrive in that environment. And yet, how we as a system um, just disregard the basic human needs of frontline staff in terms of support to live, but also just in terms of professionalization and respect. And so, just as young people feel, like really feel when the the space is framed in a deficit way that there are problems to be fixed. It's pretty clear that staff also can feel that way. And so that was a big takeaway for us, um, which was to think about um, how deficit framing also um, seeps into the, the key linchpin staff in the organization. So anyway, with that, I'm very, very pleased um, to introduce Deepa and to have all of you hear about the important research that she's doing. So Deepa, please. Thank you so much for that introduction, Bowen, and also for, I mean, capturing, I think, so well um, what we hope to communicate through our research findings. Um, and um, also your discussion about um, youth workers, I think, is a, also a great segue for me to introduce myself and a little bit about my work that brought me to this equity study. So I'm going to be sharing some slides. Um, and, you know, as I'm talking, you know, feel free to comment or react um, in, in the chat um, if things, you know, um, speak to you or if you have questions about some of the terms uh, that I'm using. And so we're going to be talking about, um, you know, the findings from this report, but I specifically wanted to highlight um, you know, program findings um, and also workforce findings as well. And so, um, but first I wanted to introduce who I am. Hi, I'm Deepa Vasudevan and um, I currently teach as a lecturer in education um, at Wellesley College. And um, for many years I uh, worked um, in Philadelphia. I worked as a youth worker in um, a school-based um, program um, focused on peace and social justice. Um, and then I actually moved into a capacity building and professional development role um, through the Out of School Time Resource Center in Philadelphia. 
And um, this was really exciting work where um, I was working with a group of people who um, were very interested in connecting all of these after school programs across the city of Philadelphia. Um, and um, I got to meet all of these amazing out of school time um, practitioners through this work and people who are very experienced being a youth worker um, and uh, running programs and thinking about um, all the inner workings of these programs. Um, and um, I moved into a research position in which I was really looking into what are some of the needs of people who work in out-of-school time programs. And um, this inspired my um, doctoral research about what motivates um, people who stay in the field, knowing all of the challenges that they face um, in out-of-school time programs. Um, and so, uh, Recently, I gave a talk where someone made this amazing sketch note based on some of my dissertation research. And, you know, I was very interested in thinking about what calls um, uh, people who work with young people to work in out-of-school time programs, right? Um, and unsurprisingly, probably to people who are here today, um, you know, youth workers are um, people who are, um, you know, really driven by social justice ideals, um, who really think about community and place when they're working with young people, um, and who are also very reflective of their own lives and the importance of after school. Um, and however, in these conversations and interviews that I was having um, with um, experienced youth workers, um, you know, a lot of the challenges came up that Bronwyn just discussed, right, um, that are about, um, you know, um, experienced youth workers still feeling like they didn't have um, rights, protections, um, salary benefits, or um, pay raises um, that allowed them to stay in the work in the way that they wanted to. And so oftentimes um, youth workers were um, taking on additional jobs, um, you know, trying to figure out how to pay back student loans. Um, and, you know, it was causing all of these forms of push out um, and burnout um, among the staff. And these, this was a group of, 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 of really committed professionals who have devoted five or more years to working in out of school time programs. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I have this huge investment already in thinking about equity from the lens of, of people who work in these programs. Um, but what was, um, you know, very exciting about being part of this team was thinking also about how do we think about equity issues that are happening within programs for staff, but also, as, I mean, especially for the young people who are in them as well. Um, and so I think Brahman already did some great framing about what a Wallace, the Wallace Foundation was looking for, um, and particularly around thinking about not just the research about what are the inequities or problems of practice, but also thinking how can we learn from programs, from program directors, from young people themselves, about how do we actually foster um, belonging within within youth programs, but especially for, um, for youth who um, are from historically marginalized backgrounds. Uh, and so, you know, this is a group I think that already really cares about out of school time and after school. Um, but we know that while children and youth spend um, a good amount of time um, in learning in school, um, that there's a whole lot of time and space where young people are growing and developing and learning outside of the classroom as well. And we know that all learning and social experiences matter for, for children's development. And um, there has been a long history of out of school time programs, right? Um, but historically, many of these after school programs have engaged youth of color and low income youth to keep um, quote unquote at risk students out of trouble, um, to encourage some forms of assimilation, whether that's to learn English or to um, you know, introduce cultural norms. Um, and also these programs have oftentimes focused on academic remediation. But we also know from our literature review that there's also all of these programs and also from our own work with young, with young people and with programs that there's programs that organize young people, um, that provide culturally relevant education, um, that there's programs that resist schooling, right? Um, and really think about being more student-centered and youth-centered in their work. Um, and so we wanted to delve in deeper than thinking about the very important ac accessibility issues with youth, youth programs. 
Um, we know from the after school lines that for, for one child or young person in a, an after school program, there's three that are waiting or interested in attending an after school program. Um, and um, there actually has been a decrease in participation um, in after school programs. Um, this was from the after school lines in 2020, um, which we can, you know, surmise that is probably due to the pandemic or financial reasons as well. Um, and so it was like with this backdrop about thinking about the current landscape that we know that there's unequal access to high quality learning opportunities in after school hours. Um, and that, you know, our team was really invested in thinking about how do we create more opportunities for enrichment and interest driven learning. Uh, and so simply put, everyone deserves access to programming beyond school hours that allow them to grow, flourish and thrive. So here's our whole team. Um, our lead uh, PI is Bianca Baldridge, who's currently at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, I also worked alongside Ben Kirshner, Sam Mejias, and Daniela DiGiacomo, um, who also led up the youth research team that I'll be talking about. We also had an amazing team of graduate students, undergraduates, and high school students that were um, helping with the project all along the way. Um, and this was a national research study. So we had representation from New York, Kentucky, Colorado, and California. So um, I'm gonna hand wave this, but this is just a little bit about like the approach that we had to the research. Um, you know, we tried to interview um, uh, through, uh, you know, community nominations, um, out of school time policy experts, research experts and practice experts. Um, we help focus groups with youth workers and youth organizers. And um, we also um, were collaborating with young people um, so that they could uh, conduct their own survey and focus groups as well. Um, and I know that we oftentimes throw around these words like equity and like, you know, I wanted to just be clear that our team was defining equity is not just, you know, being impartial or being fair, but really thinking about equity in out of school time programs as the work of individuals and communities to interrogate, name and actively disrupt structural oppressions that impact historically minoritized and marginalized youth. Um, and that we were really attentive to this idea of what is the social context that we're living in, right? So, you know, we were interviewing people all through, you know, Zoom, through online means, um, and, um, you know, and all of our work was during the pandemic, right? So we were thinking about the pandemic, but we were also thinking about issues around um, uh, gentrification. Um, uh, we were thinking about, um, the global uprisings for Black Lives in 2020 in response to the murder of George Floyd. So there was all these different ways in which we were thinking about equity um, and trying to think about how programs were, you know, thinking about that in relation to these really broad systemic issues. Um, and so I'm specifically going to talk about some of the equity challenges and responses that are related to um, uh, programs themselves um, and the workforce. Um, and, you know, if there's questions about some of our other findings, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, and so I'm going to dive into talking about understanding the challenge of fostering belonging. Um, and so based on our research findings, um, it was clear that there's still a lot of work to do to ensure that out of school time spaces are consistently anti-racist, dignity conferring and humanizing uh, for racially minoritized and LGBTQIA youth especially. Um, and so I wanted to share some definitions here. Of what, what do we mean by belonging? Here, when we were asking these questions, um, you know, oftentimes to program directors and um, to youth organizers, you know, they were talking about what does it mean to feel seen and cared for in a space. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about dignity, we're also talking about what does it mean to actually see young people's full humanities um, and um, also giving them really the right to learn and grow in these spaces the ways that they want to. And I actually think that Prama did such a great job explaining what do we mean by deficit-based that I'm going to just, um, you know, keep this definition here. Um, but yeah, like, you know, we're, we're thinking about the challenge that um, a lot of program directors talked about where there still seemed to be this disconnect between how youth workers and how young people 
um, wanted to be seen in these programs, but there was these sort of um, already underlying beliefs, right, that, um, um, you know, that these programs were also meant to like fix or save young people. Um, and that kind of, you know, changed the shape of what was being, um, you know, presented in programs um, and also how funders were viewing um, how, how programs were doing in their work. And so I wanted to lift up here also some of the youth findings um, from their focus groups, um, because they really also talked about some of the like inner challenges of these programs. Um, for example, young people talked about feeling tokenized um, in programs. Um, um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, I just wanted to share some of those barriers, you know, they, they also talked about how belonging started with actually like pretty concrete issues of access, like getting transportation to and from programs, thinking about the cost of these programs, young people having to choose between um, a job that, you know, they could pay and support their families um, versus um, actually attending the programs that they really love. Um, and, you know, they also talked about things that maybe we don't always think about as adults as we're thinking about issues of equity, um, but also thinking about who's in charge of these programs, um, you know, co competition to get into, um, into after school programs, um, but also sort of the more like social dynamics of um, favoritism and cliques that happen within out of school time programs as well. And so I wanted to move into just sharing some of the findings and some of the exciting ways in which um, OST experts and um, youth workers and organizers were talking about how, how they were already um, engaging in uh, moves towards equity. Um, and I, some of the best examples were coming up um, during focus groups that we um, conducted with youth organizers. So this included um, a lot of adaptation during COVID-19, such as using a, a digital technology really creatively, social media to touch base with young people. A lot of programs were doing mutual aid, um, becoming community center hubs for food, um, for um, exchanges for families, uh, meal drop-offs, um, um, and that you know, a lot of programs were thinking more creatively about how to not just include young people, but really get families involved, um, you know, and being those first responders to the immediate needs of, of young people and their families. Um, a lot of programs talked about the importance of, you know, developing and sustaining anti-racist people across all levels of organizations. So directors, direct service staff, but also think, rethinking like who are our board members, right? And how do we actually uh, create systems um, that are of equity um, in which people can understand and talk about um, racism within organizations. Um, a lot of these programs were highlighting the ways in which youth voice and leadership were in the fabric of the organization, um, and also talking about innovative ways to um, create income and compensation for young people so that they could actually participate in the program and not feel like um, they had to choose between working, um, you know, working after school and doing a program that they were really excited about. Um, and then a lot of programs were already engaged in doing really culturally relevant and sustaining work um, with, with young people and creating mentorship models um, so that young people felt like there wasn't just one person um, that they relied on to within the program, but that they were creating these mentorship networks for young people. And so the programs were more situated within communities that were caring for the young people as well. Um, and so again, I know I use some terms that maybe some of you are familiar with, some of you are not, but, you know, culturally sustaining, meaning supporting young people in, you know, um, uh, really sort of centering their own cultural backgrounds, their own use of language, um, and then also offering opportunities to um, what are some of the dominant cultural norms as well. For example, like, you know, if you're running a college access program, you still want to share with young people the tools of how do I get into college, but also like, you know, creating space to celebrate young people's um, um, cultural backgrounds as well. Um, and then a lot of um, the people we talked to were really centering, like, how do we um, lift up youth 
own work around leadership and organizing. Um, and so this was another move towards equity, right? In which we're not just thinking about positive youth development, but also really thinking about how young people can be drivers for social justice change. And I am conscious of the time, but maybe I'll just um, share a little bit more here. Um, I did want to share some bright spots also for young, young people that really, they love out of school time programs because it complements their interests and passions. Um, by the way, whenever I have like a really exciting dynamic slide, it's because our, our youth research team are the ones who created it. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, they really felt like these were spaces um, when they loved a program, it was because it built that sense of community for them and that they could really pursue their talents and interests. Um, and that there was flexibility from the programs in terms of their level of commi commitment. So they weren't going to get punished for not attending um, you know, a program every day. Um, um, and then of course, a big one was you know, their relationships with a mentor you know, within that program. Um, and, um, and I think that these findings like, you know, are ones that we all know, you know about like kind of the power of out of school time, but it's just very, you know, it confirms like you know that oftentimes you know, in out of school time, we're also looking for academic outcomes and all these sort of very concrete sort of changes maybe around academics. But so much of what, um, what young people were talking about was really these sort of social aspects around belonging and inclusivity. Uh, and so, um, you know, a lot of, you know, I just want to sort of reiterate this idea that, you know, um, you know, pro program directors, um, people who are um, you know, leading these programs that were towards equity, we're really thinking about, um, about intersectionality, about how organizations need to think about trauma at all levels of the organization. Um, and that it could be very empowering, right? Um, to, to teach young people about where that trauma is coming from, right? And naming those traumas. Um, and that like, you know, it's not just about protecting them from it, but also like, you know, talking about how it's not just about individual effort for young people to do well, but that they're also navigating the same types of oppressions that adults are as well. Um, and so with the remaining few minutes that I have, uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, I think this goes back actually to my own, um, you know, research interests that were also about the workforce, right? And I think um, that, um, you know, this was sort of um, really came up across our interviews and focus group findings about issues of equity, um, was that there's really this urgency to really think about the experiences and livelihoods of the direct service staff who are working with young people, um, and that these programs really depend on, on youth workers who are facilitating, facilitating these programs. Um, and that, you know, um, and their jobs are even harder, right, thinking about all of the different forms of you know, socio-political dynamics like um, housing affordability, um, gentrification, systemic racism that also impacts the staff who are working in these programs. And so I guess where I wanted to, to land today is to, for us to really um, think about um, how, the, how the field and how funders can really, um, you know, lift up um, the issues of providing a living wage um, for youth workers, um, paying attention to their well-being, um, and also for us to think about professional pathways for leadership among youth workers. Um, uh, and finally, to also for us to really promote and center the experiences of, of, of Black and, and Latinx and Indigenous practitioners in leadership positions, because um, many people we talked to um, said that they felt like there was like a, a ceiling, right, where they couldn't um, move into leadership positions from direct service staff positions. And so, you know, we're also losing, um, you know, um, really critical people um, in the field who um, are um, understand are from the same backgrounds as the children that they're serving. And so um, I will um, leave it here for now. Um, does that 
Is that, am I good on time, Rebecca? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Deepa. This was great um, overview of the research. I'm sure it was just a good teaser and that we'll get access to your slides to share out and on the website for um, from the EdFunders website. So thank you so much for that. I know it's hard to um, do it in a short amount of time, but we do want to uh, shift over to having a conversation with a couple of uh, field leaders who are living and breathing this every day. So I'd like to invite uh, Monica Arambide, uh, president and founder of Maven Youth to come on uh, to be spotlighted. Well, she'll be joined by Julie Garrow, executive director of the Cheyenne River Youth Project in South Dakota, and Angela Hamilton, vice president of youth and family services at the Chicago Ur uh, Urban League. So um, welcome Monica, Julie, and Angela. And Deepa, we're gonna keep you up here as well. Um, so what I'd like to do to start is um, to have each of you introduce yourselves and your programs and um, maybe just a short intro to how positive identity development shows up in your work. Um, so Monica, do you wanna start us off? Sure, sure, sure. I am Monica Arambide. I go by she and he, mix it up. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of Maven Youth. We are a national nonprofit that works with uh, uh, youth that are between 14 to 19. Um, and we work with LGBT plus youth. Um, and our focus is really to provide a safe space for queer youth to thrive in the tech space. So we do coding camps, we do a lot of summer learning programs. We work with LGBT uh, centers across the United States in their after school programs to provide more kind of computer science workshops. Um, so that's a little bit of who we are. Um, the other thing that I want to touch upon how leadership shows up or how we address kind of the youth voices in our program is majority, if not all, our program is led by youth. So we do have tech professionals, amazing tech professionals from Pixar to Google or what have you that will come in maybe offer some insights in their careers, but really the facilitation of that, the curriculum, the instruction of coding, all of that has been created and developed by our youth that actually have come through our programs. And so we have a leadership model, like a youth council leadership model that are the ones that really have voice within our programs. So our, our organization is led by the pulse of um, these young folks. The other thing to note just really quickly uh, that's really kind of unique is that our organization as though it's focused on computer science, 90% of our youth do not know a single line of code, how to do that. Um, and yet we are empowering them to end up being the teachers to other youth that are coming into the program. And that is all reflective in the fact that it is youth leading youth, right? And there's this trust and this allowance of themselves to see themselves in a positive light. So they see a young person leading a coding workshop, they can see themselves leading a coding workshop, and then now they become the leader and instructor of our coding programs. So um, that's a little bit of a nutshell of who I am. So I'm gonna pass it off to um, another panel member. And actually, Monica, just before you finish, uh, so thinking about identity development, you know, you're, you're delivering this work through a lens of workforce readiness and tech, but how does that show up in the day-to-day -day work since you're working with LGBTQ plus folks, you're working with professionals who are LGBTQ plus identifying? If you just say a, a word about that. Yeah, great. This is a great example. Um, so within our organization, majority of the youth that actually come in, in our program is in the spectrum of gender, right? So they are in and, in and out of flowing of what their identities are going to be um, in many levels, right? And so how do we empower them is like, for instance, one prime example is our virtual camps. They are allowed to pick their name. Um, they're allowed to present their, their pronouns, whichever it is. Sometimes their pronouns are wolf, right? Um, and so they put their name, their chosen name, and then they'll put a pronoun for us to address them by. Um, and that can change within two to 
to three days, right? Um, and so we're constantly looking on our, that, that's a prime example of kind of looking at the Zoom link and name and honoring who they feel and who they are that day, right? Um, and it can be challenging in the aspects of, oh, I remember them as Wolf, and now they're identifying as no pronouns. I don't want no pronouns addressed. So just refer to me, for instance, me would be Monica. Just keep saying Monica, Monica, and don't use no pronouns. Um, and so identity development for us is, is critical and it's, it's flowing, right? So we're constantly in that ups and flows within our organization is to always meet the youth where they are. So creating a safe environment to say, hey, I want to be dressed as wolf, that's not laughable, right? That it's not, it's honoring who they are and then let's keep moving forward because at the end of the day, we want you to learn computer science, right? So we want to honor who you are in the, in the way you're going to feel safe and show up and great, now you're going to start being engaged. And some of the gender identities we have, like I mentioned, tech professionals that come in, you could see that get played out within their, even within their company and organization. So how does that look like? What do, what do I mean by that? So when we go into um, a particular tech company, they might not have gender neutral bathrooms, right? So, so what, some of our policies are, you know, because our youth are so many, we want to create a positive environment for many kind of identities within our program. So we would like a gender neutral bathroom that's going to be close to the area that youth are going to be. And sometimes that creates a lot of conversations within tech. And then lo to behold, right, we come back the next summer and then the tech company actually said, we actually build gender neutral bathrooms throughout our campus, but it was never really brought to our attention until you came in to our camp, right? And so when we are able to share those stories out to the youth, they were like, wow, I see my identities being respectful in the workspace. Um, so I hope that answers a little bit of, yeah, of it. That's helpful. Thank you. Julie, do you want to introduce your work and um, what positive identity development looks like with your youth? Sure. Good morning, everybody. I am Julie Garrow. I am a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. I live on the Cheyenne River Lakota Reservation, which is comprised of four bands of the Lakota. Uh, our organization, the Cheyenne River Youth Project, has been around for about 34 years. I'm actually the founder and still executive director of the, of the work that we're doing there. I'm very pleased to see where we came from. Um, we started in this old bar called the Little Brown Jug, and now we've evolved to where we have a campus, uh, about five acre campus, where we have a youth center, a teen center, organic garden, an art park. We have a strong social enterprise aspect to us, cafe, coffee shop, food truck, um, that type of thing. Uh, we have a very strong internship program that we've developed over the years where kids are able to uh, enroll in a, just about seven different internships, ranging from the arts to social enterprise to native wellness. We just launched a creative writing one and a Lakota culture and uh, um, Lakota culture and language internships. So there's seven different internships that our kids are able to uh, participate in. They are a combination of very specific classes in the areas that they're enrolled, but then they're also, uh, there's life skills classes like you know financial literacy and CPR and first aid and those kinds of things. So uh, we're, I think we're doing a lot of kids. I think uh, they, my staff told me that we've had over 1500 kids complete uh, internships. So that's, that means a lot to me considering we started with 10, I think back in 2013. So the program has really grown and taken off. But I think the one thing that when I'm when I'm thinking about um, identity and thinking about the work that we do, you know, we're a Lakota community, and if you know anything about the history of Native peoples in this country, you know that it's it's a harsh one, and it would be I think maybe different if um, if the assaults were not still coming, if there were still not initiatives to take you know, whether it's land or culture or language. So I think the one thing that we do in all the work that we do is uh, remind them, um, support them in, in growing to a healthy Lakota person, a community member. All of the folks who work at the Shine River Youth Project come from the community, are Lakota. I'm Lakota, uh, everybody who works with them is Lakota. And I think that's really one of the most important things that we can do because I think we all, you know, we all kind of look at each other and say, we're all res kids. We all come from the res. We get it. We know what you're going through. I will say though, when I think back uh, 34 years ago, when I was a young person 
it's a much tougher life, I think, for young people. So we try to, to keep that in mind. But, you know, there's so many other things. And, and for us, we have determined, and I think our, our model, of course, is just offering options and opportunities to these kids. Grow to who you want to be. But in every piece of that, we are reminding them that they are Lakota. So the one cool thing I always talk about is that, you know, these kids, this generation is growing up in an age where it is okay to be Lakota. You know, of course, you know, uh, you know, I grew up in the boarding schools. So I grew up where I couldn't speak my language. I didn't get to learn it. My parents were beat. My sisters and siblings were beat for, for being Lakota. And they were just generally abused, you know. So these kids are growing up and they have their challenges. There's no doubt about it. But the one thing that we always do is remind them that you are here, that we see you, that we listen to you, and you are Lakota. And that is the most important thing for all of us because people will always say like, you know, you know, what is the most important thing for you? I'm like, I'm Lakota first above all. And that's what I think our kids need to understand. So when we're doing the work with them, you know, we, we, we're, we're all coming from that same place. And, you know, why are we doing this work? It's because we are, um, that's what we're supposed to do. When I think about, you know, uh, my parents were public service and the lesson they gave me is that you always take care of community. So a part of what we do with kids too is community service, you know, making sure they understand the value and understand the cultural um, aspect of, of service to their community. So it's, you know, really when we think about um, positive identity and doing that work, it is all about making sure that Lakota culture, language, um, values are embedded in every aspect of what we're doing. So like say, you know, we have an internship that talks about indigenous cooking. We have food sovereignty initiatives. You know, those are every piece about like your food systems, our food systems. And of course we're talking about food insecurity and health benefits, but we're also talking about what foods were sacred to us, what made us healthy. So, you know, we are really are going back to where we came from. And uh, I think the beautiful part is that you know, I was just talking to one of my staff members and her daughter comes to the center and she said, they go to school and, you know, you talk about trauma and she said they are, uh, you know, they get hollered at or that, you know, whatever's going on. She said she never feels that when she comes to our youth center. And, you know, why would we do that? I mean, I just don't get why you have to holler at kids, you know, it's so much about a relationship and a conversation and yeah, kid, kid work can be tough. And, uh, but you know, that's, that's what we signed on to do. And the other piece of this that I think is, you know, we don't go home to, at the end of the day and say, oh, our clients, those are our clients, we walk away. You know, these are our relatives. These are our friends. Every single, you know, we go home to the same people that we serve every day. So it's not like there's a separation, you know? So. You know, we, we know what's happening in our community because it is our community and those kids are our relatives. So we are very, very connected. And that expression, uh, is we are we all related. And if we're all related, then we all need to take care and we need to love each other and respect one another. So I think that's really strongly embedded. But I think the work we do with kids is just very, I think, innovative and creative and it's still really fun but always reminding them like who you are. So, you know, of course we scold kids. Of course we have to discipline kids. Of course we have to remind them that that behavior is not okay. But I think what we do it, we do it in a manner that reminds them of their value system. So is that generous? Is that respectful? Is that wise? You know, that kind of thing is the kind of work that we approach, but uh, you're right. I, I heard you talk earlier about taking care of your, um, your workers. You know, it, you know, we work really hard to make sure we have benefits packages and we've been working as we can, you know, but we, you know, we're like everybody else. We don't have all the money in the world, but, you know, we try to, to take care. We raised our, you know, the entrance level uh, position, the wages. Uh, we have a good benefits package. We offer a retirement now and we are just doing everything because this is tough work. But again, I want to take care of them so that they can do the work and I want to take care of the kids. So we have to find the balance of doing the both. But, you know, we are, our identity is 100% Lakota people. 
And, you know, we kind of just say, you know, for Cheyenne River, by Cheyenne River, because it's an initiative we created and we sustain and we do it in the manner that reflects where we come from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I suppose we could have maybe done it easier, signed on to a national organization that, you know, but we wanted to do it you know, our way, something that honors our people, its challenges, its history, its trauma, et cetera. So um, you. yeah, you're welcome. Julie, the, there's so much richness there and so much um, related to this conversation. And I, I would love to hear you continue. I wanna make sure we bring Angela into the conversation. Um, so thank you so much for sharing about your rich culture and the work you're doing with young people. Angela, um, welcome to come on and share the work you're doing at the Chicago Urban League. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela Hamilton. I am uh, the Vice President of Youth and Family Services at the Chicago Urban League. We are an affiliate of the National Urban League. And here at the Urban Leagues, we um, are very intentional and purposeful in trying to improve the lives of um, our Black and Brown youth, um, all surrounding around the um, marginalization that we receive as, as Black people, um, as Brown people. Um, I am a clinician by trade. Um, and so what that means is that I used to do therapy uh, with children and um, families for a long period of time. And I have taken that um, education and applied it to um, focus on social emotional learning for our youth. Um, and really understand that meeting youth and families where they are are very critical. And a lot of times you find people in leadership roles who really have no idea of what it means to meet people where they're at. You know, um, that absolutely means not being judgy about where they are. Um, are they stuck in poverty? Are they um, not understanding how to adequately provide for their families because the opportunities are not there for them? How do you actually service someone that identifies differently who is not cisgender, right? How do you do that? Um, how do you protect those youth who identify in the LGBTQ community? How do you do that? Not every youth worker knows anything about that. Not any um, youth worker or staff for that matter knows how to work with someone who may have a IEP, someone who um, comes from a uh, family that may be uh, experiencing domestic violence. So one of the first things that we do literally is provide for staff is provide a robust training. So um, all of staff go through a safe zone training for LGBTQ. Understand what it means, how that youth may feel, right? When I was coming up, um, I'm not that old, but old enough. Um, there were not a lot of ways that um, people could identify. The TV was always one, a man and a woman, right? And that's what the family makeup was. It was a lot of white families on TV. There were no black folks on TV. There were absolutely no um, male and male female uh, relationships, right? That, that, that did not exist. Um, so when we talk about safe zone, how did that person feel waking up that morning saying, I feel a particular way. I, I am biologically born a female and I am actually attracted to this other female, but I don't see that. I don't see that in the community. I don't see it on TV. People say that that's a bad thing, but that's how I feel. How do I relate? How as a staff, how do you recognize that you may have a child that you're servicing that is going to absolutely identify differently. How do you make that space safe for them? So we absolutely, they go through a safe zone training. Um, sexual abuse, depression, mental health trainings. We all go through all of those trainings because you need to be able to identify it, 
when you see it. You do not say something's going on with that kid. That kid is crazy. All bad language, right? Well, okay, if they are behaving differently, why are they behaving differently? Don't sit in the corner and talk about them. Let's figure it out. Um, meeting them where they are really becomes about being um, educated to the various things that our youth are exposed to or the lack thereof. Our programming um, really focuses on providing access to those uh, black and brown students that we normally wouldn't have. So we have STEM year round, uh, building apps, robotics. Um, we have STEM camps, right? Um, trades instruction. The National Urban League is very big on post-secondary education. Well, not every youth are going to go to college. It, it is not in the cards. So how do we help our black and brown youth um, be able to be not just good citizens, but be able to provide for themselves? We offer and teach them trades, painting, general carpentry, um, welding, electrician. Like these are wonderful professions that make lots of money. <laughs> like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being electrician. Um, we provide career readiness. How do you absolutely, how do you fill out an application correctly? How do you represent yourself in an interview so that you can get the, in, the internship, so that you can get the job? Um, another thing that we are focusing in on is um, the youth absolutely care about the community. Um, in Chicago, you all know, and in just not Chicago, there's always this tussle between the community and the police, particularly the black and brown police. Um, our youth are concerned about it, and we have created a new initiative called Empower Youth Action, and we are going school by school. Um, similar, they get an opportunity to vote for their peers to represent their class. And in that we are having police districts come and develop relationships. You ask for the community to say something when you see something. Well, am I gonna call 911 if I know something? Who am I calling? Who's the operator who's gonna be like, and who are you? And is this a prank? No, but if you have a relationship with Officer Anderson, you're more likely to come and talk to Officer Anderson and say, Officer Anderson, I saw A, B, and C. We have to actually provide rich programming for the concerns that our youth have. Um, we have to ask them the question, what do you want to do? We know what they may need in order to, you know, get to that point where they can provide for themselves once they reach that. But we also still have to understand that their voice, they have thoughts, they have um, concerns, and we have to be able to foster positive relationships and interactions with them. And the moment we stop doing that, the moment we stop trying to do that, we are in trouble. Um, as a executive leader, I think that listening to staff is just as important as listening to the kids. I am not in the classrooms with them. I am not the ones building the, the robots with them. I'm just authorizing the payment of the equipment. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? So what do I need to make sure that I am providing not just great services, but top notch. How do I ensure that staff are happy so that they don't leave me, right? We do surveys, we do um, engagement activities. Um, I tell them, thank you all the time, right? Because saying something as simple as thank you for the work that you do goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, providing professional development is huge. People want to grow. People want to learn. They, if you are in this field, you're in this field because you love 
youth or what it is you do. Help them. Yes. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I have to be the no guy to interrupting everyone here. I, um, you all have made my job easy because you shared so much rich content about your work and how you support young people where they're at and they're being part of the community and supporting each other. I know we're at the end of our time, so I want to just ask for a quick rapid fire. Knowing that this is a community of youth leaders, youth field leaders, and funders, one piece of advice to the group in order to keep this work going that you do in your community, what would it be? And then I'll put a couple of reminders to the group um, of what's coming up in the chat. I uh, would say be open to the possibility of everything. Okay. Be open to it. All right, thanks. How about you, Julie? Oh, you're on mute. I think it's really extremely important to uh, let the community be your guide mm -hmm. and, and, and let them be the leaders in this work because it's our community, it's our culture, it's our, it, it's our young people that we're trying to uh, build on and we're really working to save an entire you know, nation. So I would say mm -hmm. let them be the lead. Mm -hmm. And I will say um, opportunity. It's always providing an opportunity, a place at the table I think just creating opportunities for you to share their voices and feel safe goes a long way. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I wish we had another half hour at least to hear more from these amazing leaders. I want to thank you each, um, Bronwyn, Dr. Abbasi-Davin, Monica, Angel Angela, and Julie. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, so rich in what you do. And I uh, want to make sure everyone knows that our next month's call has changed the date to the end of the month, the 24th, um, instead of the third Friday of the month. So mark that in your calendars. And uh, for funders, we have two more upcoming events, one next week on uh, May 25th around mental health and social emotional learning and differentiating between the two. And then there will be a funder meetup for our Ed Funders members on uh, June 7th. Um, so thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great weekend and um, we'll see you soon.